By any general definition, something which is rare is something that is not made in any great volume. In the automotive world, that would be the opposite of a Toyota Camry or a Ford F-150. Now, over the past year or so, you and I have had our fair share of very rare automotive experiences, like for example, the BMW M2 CS. They're going to make about 2,000 of those globally. Uh, the Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Goldwing, they made 1,400 of those globally. Or the Audi RS6, something practical, but they're only gonna bring about 500 of those a year to the US. Now, we can agree that all of those examples are rare, but how would we describe a car that they're only gonna make 60 of. Being you and I have already covered one of the bigger headlines as to how this RCF is more special than the RCFs that have come before it, let's kick things off with some of the bits that haven't changed. Biggest being a five liter V8, naturally aspirated, let me put that another way, no turbochargers, 472 horsepower, 395 pound-feet of torque, that drives only the rear wheels. We are kicking things off with a lot of good news today. However, drives those rear wheels only through an eight-speed torque convert automatic. We will cover more of that later. Then there's the fuel economy, and here there's a bit of a surprise in that the fuel economy doesn't suck, at least entirely. 16, 24, 19 combined. And then there are the performance figures. Let's do this in reverse. 168 miles an hour VMAX, zero to 60, it's slightly improved. They shaved off just a little bit of time. Toyota Lexus, they get very specific about this. 3.96 seconds to 60. I'm gonna go ahead and round that up to four seconds. But that brings us to a very obvious question. How, with an engine that is effectively the same, with effectively the same output, in effectively the same vehicle, how does it go just a bit quicker in that sprint to 60? And the answer being there's some small changes to the architecture. No, not the double wishbones in the front or the multi-link in the rear. Some of the body panels, like the hood, the roof, and a very obnoxious wing in the rear, as well as some trim pieces in the air dam as well as the bumper, that's all made of carbon fiber. So with all that carbon fiber, one would think this, it would be a lightweight. Well, not exactly, 3,946 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 1,790 kilograms uh, with that Sport Plus mode. Oh yes, it is good to be back in an NAV8. Uninterrupted torque from about 2,000, 2,500 RPM all the way up to about 5,500 RPM, and there's quite a bark. Yes, God, man, that transmission, it does not want to shift when I want to shift it. So let's move to the transmission then. Uh, this, it's a good transmission for around town. It is good for something as a Lexus should be, but this type of Lexus, aside from the many denied shifts, what's missing here is the instantaneous shifts you would get out of the dual clutch, and that would be a better match to this kind of personality of engine, as well as the torque coming out of this engine. So something different since you and I have driven an RCF together, and that would be the carbon ceramic rotors, 15 inch diameter rotors in the front, 13.6 in the back, uh, very direct, good stopping power, okay pedal modulation, not as great that you'd get, say, out of a Porsche, but then again, it's trying to be something different. Overall, I'd say it would probably work really well on a track. The question I have with this thing is who would take it to a track? It's almost 4,000 pounds. Yeah, it's got unusually good stopping power and great power coming out of the engine, not to mention great sound, but I just don't see it as a track car. And now pressing on to a rather pleasant surprise, and that would be the steering. This really shouldn't be a surprise to me because we've driven this car before, but only one time on a track that was like five years ago. And there we learned it's good feedback, it's direct, but most importantly, really good weight to the steering, something I wouldn't expect from a Lexus, but then again, it's a Lexus with an NAV8 and a lot of torque going to the rear wheels. Now, somewhat related to that, there is a bit of understeer on display here, and it's not in the usual like 911 way because there's no weight in the nose. Here, there's definitely weight in the nose. If I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, this is a function of just so much brute force going to the rear wheels, and sometimes you can overdrive the front wheels of the car. And that brings us to the all-important control over the planes of motion and here another surprise there's really good control over pitch virtually no squat no dive here something I wouldn't expect from a 4,000 pound vehicle 
Is it because of the carbon fiber on the roof or the carbon fiber? No, it's probably not. It's more a function of the way the suspension is set up and probably some of the trickery, the magic that Iguchi-san put in this thing like five years ago. Now, yes, that does include adjustable dampers, but what's different in this application, there is a huge delta between comfort and sport plus modes. When you drive this thing around town, it kind of drives like a pseudo normal Lexus. Is it an ES? No, but it feels like an RC350, not even F Sport. But in this mode, Sport Plus, there is the control over all the planes of motion. So I go so far as to saying it's almost livable on a daily basis because of that delta between the Comfort and Sport Plus modes. Then there is the biggest Yaguchi-san trick, and that is a combination of a limited slip differential in the back, as well as a torque vectoring control system. Now that doesn't sound unique, but what is unique is how it works. There is an electric motor that sits next to the differential that adjusts the torque from side to side in addition to the usual limited slip differential that you get in say like a Mercedes. So here it can shift torque faster from side to side, which is the reason why I'm able to do this kind of stuff in a car that weighs 4,000 pounds. And can I say, <laughs> This is a downright fun car to drive, something one would not expect from a Lexus. Like the LC500, I love that car. I would write a check for that car. That's how much I love it, probably the convertible. That one I'd classify as a full-on GT, a damn good one at that. But this, this is such a pisser to drive, an unexpected one at that. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game on the Absence Game with today's contestant, Something that will be arguably harder to find in the future than a 19, say, 92, perfect condition, low mileage, SC300 with a manual transmission. This is the 2021 Lexus RCF Mount Fuji Edition for a base price of, belt in, 97,100 dollars. Yes, you are probably thinking, well, aren't those things like 65 grand base price? Uh, to be exact, they're $65,875. Pressing on, the color. These are on offer only in two colors. Uh, number one is the Arctic Blast, which is a matte white, obviously. That is not this car. Uh, the name of this is either Cloudburst Gray or Sonic Chrome. Either way, it is a gray metallic. It looks good in certain lights. Let me press on to the triple beam LED headlights. These are something new for all RCFs for 2021. And I have to say they do look pretty cool, better than the triple beam thing looked on the LS500 for 2021, $1,160. Uh, then we add the Mark Levinson sound system and the navigation system optional in a $97,000 car, $2,725. Uh, then the intuitive park assist, also optional in a $97,000 car, $500. The only other thing we add to this is the destination and handling from Tahara, Japan for $1,025. Bring this to a total retail price of $102,510. Now, I have sandbagged you throughout this episode because for $102,510, it's not the car that one gets. It's the car and a watch that comes with the car. Uh, you see, this is called the MSTR or Meister watch, I believe. I am a watch guy. You guys kind of know this about me. And for those of you that have been kind of eagle-eyed throughout this episode, you notice I'm not wearing my Omega or one of my other watches. Uh, this is an unusual watch. It's an automatic. I've done some digging. Turns out this company, they're based in Los Angeles, and they do these custom collaborations with a number of different brands, not just cars. Like for example, they do a couple of things with Star Wars. They do some stuff with Marvel Comics. They've even done some stuff with Honda on the Civic Type R and even one watch with Ford. So this is kind of something they've been doing for a while. Here, it's unique to Lexus in that they changed the band. It's leather, but you can see they're picking up the theme of the carbon fiber than the case has Lexus engraved in it. Then the bottom of the case 
has that very beautiful kind of window through to see the automatic movement. Now, full disclosure, while this is indeed a lovely watch, especially with the F logo on its face, it is sadly A, not a chronograph, B, I do not love the packaging it comes with, and C, it is not up to the quality of like the usual suspects that car guys, playing guys, and watch guys seek out in this space. Omegas, Breitlings, Rolex, IWC kind of stuff. Which brings us to another challenge specific to this car. Uh, this car is 37 out of the 60 that will be built. Uh, whoever gets this specific car will not be getting the watch because when Kumo and I hand this car back to Lexus, my guess is the watch will not be in the car when they pick it up. I am going to go ahead and say out loud what you are thinking right about now. Wow, that is a lot of money in premium for a limited edition Lexus RCF. What is the difference besides the watch? Well, on the inside, there's a little bit of a difference, uh, something that has been smack dab in the middle of your face throughout this entire episode, and that would be the circuit red interior. It works for the gray. I have to say, I'm not really a red interior kind of a guy, but with the right color, it works. But then there is something that is rather unusual. So one of the themes of this entire car is the carbon fiber. Uh, and they bring that to the inside of the vehicle as well. But what's unique about that is they wrap the color into the carbon fiber weave. So the circuit red interior, yeah, you see it on the top of the dash, you see it on the seats, but you see it in the weave of the carbon fiber. I have to say, even as not a carbon fiber fan, I really love the color in the weave. But multicolor carbon fiber weave aside, again, if I were voting, I would say there needs to be more of a differentiation on the inside of the vehicle to justify that premium. Couple of suggestions, yeah, this probably should be on the wish list. Leather cover on the top of the dash, top of the door panels with some contrast stitch, that would go a long way, not only to add to the differentiation, but to add to the details that already work in an RCF, like that wonderful analog clock, or just the build quality, the fit and finish on the inside of the vehicle, it's closer to a Lexus LS and an LC than it is a UX. And as such, it should be special, special is only gonna be, what, 60 of them? Right about now, I can't help but feeling that I'm in a very unusual position, and here's why I say that. Whatever summary I present to you is a complete and utter waste of time. Why? Because at 60 total units, they most likely have sold out of all of them. So whatever you and I think, it just does not matter, which brings us to the wish list. And here again, it's a waste of our time to present tactical ideas of improvement, such as the dual clutch, leather on the dash, or something that would be pretty cool, that color weave that's in the carbon fiber on the dash. Do that outside the car on the hood and the roof. Rather, our time is better spent discussing the future RCF. And here I've got a couple of ideas for improvement. Let's stick with the NA V8. Perhaps an alternative option for like a lower end model is an NA inline six, both on offer with a manual transmission. Stick with the two doors, but let's ditch the rear seat. And instead of a trunk, let's do a hatchback, then design wise, make it a bit more swoopy. And the biggest suggestion, let's not call it a Lexus, let's call it a Toyota. And this is the point of the episode where it turns around to you guys to all find in the comments below or via our social media, Motoman TV on Word, Motoman TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, until I see you in the next episode, if you guys really need to know the time in Mount Fuji, feel free to hit me up on the socials.